So many people are fearful, of course, when you hear a word like partnering, that that somehow suggests a lack of rigor. You know, in President Obama's words, it uh, does it mean that we uh, we finish up with with a sort of loss of integrity, a loss of uh, proper discipline in that relationship, or I think he termed them cozy relationships, which of course are the absolute anathema, as we know, to public sector contracting. So. What do we mean by it? Well, I'd like to just position a little bit before we go into some charts and suggest that um, actually one of the organizations we're working with closely here in the UK at the moment talks about how for their business to be sustainable, they need to start thinking in terms of a spectrum of partnership. And by that, they do not mean lack of rigor, discipline, and appropriate uh, uh, performance management of their supply base, but they do recognize that they have a wide array of, of suppliers on whom they have a tremendous level of dependency. And of course, that partnering ranges from something which is really quite arm's length in terms of a commodity supply, a, you know, a fairly standard purchase order type relationship, right the way through to obviously what might constitute, say, a joint venture or an eventual acquisition. So along that journey, there are a multitude, well, a multitude's a bit of an exaggeration, but there are a number of options in terms of how we would engage. I mentioned joint venture. It could be a teaming agreement or some form of collaboration agreement. Um, it may be an outsourcing arrangement. Uh, it may be that you simply have some sort of uh, frame agreement for multiple projects and activities. And of course, you may have a multitude of, no, I'm back to my multitude. It won't be a multitude, don't worry. You may have a number of different relationships with the same supplier, which of course introduces another level of complexity in some ways, in the sense that I have a management system that looks a bit like this when you're dealing with me for that activity, but a very different one when it comes to another activity. Now, the secret of effective partnering, I think, is that we do think about it as that spectrum. And I think one of the key points is we've got to understand that there isn't some sudden point at which we move from treating somebody really badly because they're just a commodity supplier to treating them really nicely because they happen to be a more meaningful partner. You know, in our general day-to-day -day lives, we probably have a spectrum of relationships that we seem to be able to manage. And we probably show similar characteristics in many of those. Of course, the level of proximity probably varies depending upon the nature of that relationship. But at the same time, you know, basic courtesy, honesty, integrity, looking for people who make meaningful commitment, and seeking to make meaningful commitment back, keeping our word, wanting levels of transparency in the relationship. Those are all features that we would probably consider important as we move across varying levels of trust, confidence, and expectation. So I think if we think about that as a little bit of a background, we need to take a lot of those characteristics as we think about partnering for success. Now, my first chart is automatically going to cause a number of you to um, want to leave the room because it mentions National Audit Office. Um, but don't worry, I don't think they're here. But the reason that they're up there on the logo is not because I've decided to, to hijack it, it's because we, in fact, uh, have been doing some, a number of interesting projects with the Audit Office and uh, the results I'm going to show you were actually a it was an example of partnering for success, I suppose. Um, we wanted to look at broader attitudes to contracting and commercial capability. We wanted to understand what actually, if you look across a, a, a diverse group of people who are producers of, users of, victims of contracts, what do they think the attributes of good contracting are in significant projects, in environments where in fact you need a meaningful level of partnering. So what I'm going to take you through, if I may, is the results of that study, 
It uh, attracted input from about a thousand people. It was fairly international in its input. About 25% of the people were public sector employees, um, by deduction therefore. Many others were private sector employees, people who were engaged similarly in partnering. It wasn't looking specifically at public sector partnering, it was looking more generically. But our results do break down differences in attitude between public and private sector. We thought you might find that interesting. And it also actually had about 10% of people from what I came to understand is the third sector, which wasn't something I've ever used before particularly, but I know you will know what it means. Um, and as far as I can make out, it means people like ICCM, a non-profit association, uh, or indeed other volunteer groups and so on. So it was a pretty diverse input and from a functional background also quite diverse because of course partnering tends to matter not only at the inception, how do we put it together, how do we negotiate a partnering type arrangement, so that involves people from say procurement, it involves people from legal, it involves people from contract management in various forms, but, and of course people from the sales contracting world, but then also in the post award environment where you've got the delivery team, so there were a good number of project managers, for example, who gave input to this as well. So, quite a diverse community, but quite a large consistency of viewpoint. So the areas we're going to touch on are these. Um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the role of contracts and commercial capability in establishing constructive working relationships. Um, there are those out there who would, of course, take the view that contracts and the construction of contracts is very much the uh, enemy of a good working relationship. Indeed, I remember um, one CEO that I had worked with in my years at IBM and he'd moved on, become CEO of a major outsourcing provider, in fact one that uh, you use, although he isn't CEO there any longer. Um, and they had started talking about uh, collaborative relationships and I was very pleased. He was early into the scene of talking about collaboration as being important. So I called him and I said, uh, Pierre, I'm delighted to see that you've taken this initiative on collaboration. And I said, um, tell me, what has that meant to the way you're going to go about your contracting and negotiation? There was a lengthy pause and then he said, well, I suppose we'd say that you can have a collaborative relationship in spite of the contract. And that, of course, is unfortunately still the attitude that many have. The contract is often thought of as this legal weapon that we can use and wield as necessary to punish wrongdoing. And that there's a great emphasis on that role of the contract in acting as a negative incentive to perform. Now, as many of you will know, I pr presume, at least I'm right in this, given where I am today in the... Ministry of Justice, um, you probably would mostly acknowledge the point that running systems purely on the basis of negative incentives is probably not the best way to, to reform people or to actually gain acquiescence or an inclusive or collaborative society. It probably isn't a great mechanism to build platforms of trust or openness and honesty. So the same really applies in this world of contracts. If we think only in terms of allocating risks, in terms of punishing wrongdoing, of negative incentives to perform, then we tend to get poor performance. We tend to get a lack of openness, transparency and honesty. In other words, we undermine all of those features that actually could make something into a partnership. And often we overlook the fundamental areas of what are our common interests. Are we really suited for each other? You know, have we just met on match.com, but unfortunately you put up a whole load of lies in terms of what your real personality was and it wasn't your photo? Or have we actually met somebody with whom we have true affinity? So how do we bring that sort of rigor in? How do we bring better selection procedures and so on? It's stuff we're going to touch on as we look at these various items.
The other thing I'd like to highlight is that we should be thinking about our contracts and our commercial practices as a way to build quality into relationships and to sustain that quality. There's a lot of conversation and talk these days about lean procurement. In fact, I was at a conference this morning and Margaret Hodge was there talking about lean procurement, although she acknowledged she didn't really know what it meant. But, um, but I think, you know, if we think about lean, it's not, of course, just about being efficient. It isn't just about, you know, shedding jobs. Lean is actually about quality. It's about driving quality into the system. It's about ensuring that the jobs that we have are jobs that are there to add value as opposed to jobs that are just to fix problems because there was a lack of quality. So another of the challenges we'll talk about is how much do we understand and use our contracts and contracting experiences to drive quality into our systems? We'll touch on issues like the causes of dispute and we'll talk a little bit there about how that could be a driver of greater quality. So let's get going on our little journey. The general view of those who were participating in the study was that contract negotiation can indeed be used to underpin the development and establishment of a constructive working relationship. So that was the good news. I sent the message to Pierre that he was wrong. Um, and uh, so we asked them, well, what areas do you think are important uh, in terms of that constructing positive relationship? 99% said defining clear, mutually understood objectives. In other words, in a sense, have we got common views of what are we trying to achieve? Because if we don't actually have agreement over what we're trying to achieve, there's a very good chance we won't achieve it. So I suppose no great surprise that people say it's important. I don't know what the 1% who said it wasn't are thinking, but, um, but that was one of the major purposes that people were highlighting out of contracts in the contracting process. And by the way, I think we need to think all today very much about negotiation being a continuum. When does negotiation begin? Well, Actually, in many cases, of course, it begins before you've even issued any sort of tender or RFP. You are already engaging and setting expectations and having a degree of negotiation long before that bidding process begins. Now, many people then think, well, yes, but okay, at least it comes to an end because to the extent we negotiate, once we've got that contract signed, that's the end of that piece of it. Well. If you're in China, I'm told they believe that negotiation starts when the contract is signed. And increasingly, isn't that true for us too? Just how static are our requirements? How static is the world we're operating in? The frequency of change continues to grow apace. In fact, our research suggests that the average contract today uh, changes 30% more frequently than they did four years ago. So negotiation is in fact a continuum across the life cycle. Yet one of the challenges, of course, is very often we haven't developed the skills in our, in our deployment teams, in our delivery teams, to actually manage that continuum of negotiation. And many times the experts have vanished. So that's one of the challenges that people see. It's not just about making sure that we've got clear, mutually understood objectives at the outset of our relationship, it's have we actually kept them on track? Are we actually up to date with how those objectives have changed? So let's move on and look at the slightly more detailed version of this. So as you can see, um, number two on the list is appropriate risk allocation based on a common understanding of the risks. Now that's challenging. How open, how honest are we about the risks that we perceive? How open, how honest are our suppliers? Do we create the framework? Do we create the discussion forum in which we're open about those risks? Or in fact, do we deliberately try and keep <coughs> them hidden because we're afraid that if we're honest about the risk in us, that nobody will bid or that their price will go up? 
But the other side is, how thoughtful are we about that issue of risk allocation? There is unfortunately a belief in government, in politicians very often, that somehow risk can be allocated to somebody else. So public procurement policy, of course, tends to create a lot of contracting terms, particularly around liabilities, indemnities, approaches to liquidated damages, etc., where there is an automatic approach to risk allocation. But can you ever really escape risk? Can government ever really allocate the risk elsewhere? When that headline appears in the Daily Mail, <laughs> who's it going to be talking about? So our belief that we can allocate risk elsewhere is often an illusion. And if we try and hide behind the concepts of standard framework agreements and other things, that again is a potential source of weakness. I don't think there will be too many items on that list that will come as too big a shock to you. But what our respondents are saying is that contracts do indeed have a wider purpose and we need to think about these principles as we go into contracting and these and, and the other charts you'll see in many ways I think represent a useful checklist as you think about building partnered relationships to say have we covered these things off? Have we created the right forums for these things to be properly discussed uh, not only now but actually on an ongoing basis? And have we chosen the right supplier who shows the levels of integrity and capability that are necessary for these sorts of characteristics to apply. So in a sense, building on that, as we looked at uh, the influence of the contract on successful project delivery, and I'm sorry I'm saying the contract, but actually here, let me just make sure that I'm clear about the distinction. We think about contracting as a holistic process. Contracting goes right the way from really the inception of understanding of what it is we're trying to do to the eventual delivery of an output or an outcome. And it is, in that sense, a holistic process from which the contract is an output. Indeed, a contracting process could quite legitimately decide that you don't want to have a formal contract at all. That would be a perfectly acceptable output from that, uh, from that process. It might not be acceptable in a government context, but it would be for me. I mean, as an association, we don't actually do contracts much. We see them as far too laborious to put together. But of course, I wouldn't like to say that, would I? <laughs> so, ensuring real <clears throat> realistic understanding, the potential for driving a positive relationship, and Importantly, the role of the contracting process in ensuring selection of the right supplier. Now, that is a very important point, and I think a very important point particularly for public sector and government. To what extent you are able to make sure that you've got the right supplier has tended to be a real problem in government often because, again, of public procurement rules and the limitations that you feel you're under in terms of competitive dialogue, the extent of engagement with the supply base, the extent of valid investigation, the fear that, uh, of course, if you uh, use too many criteria that you may be open to challenge, etc. In today's world, we have to apply much more rigour and we have to start thinking of a wider set of characteristics that we're going to use in supplier selection. Because the people you're choosing are no longer people who are just giving you an input and selling you a product and, yeah, it's your responsibility to make it work. These are increasingly people that you're engaging with essentially for a lifetime. It's gone from a friendship and a casual relationship to the potential of marriage. And probably many of you, you know, if you're like me, have discovered to your cost that those are different processes. I'm still learning <laughs> because there's an environment of tremendous change and we all still need to learn. These characteristics of building good relationships and selecting the right partners are really important. So, for instance, how many of you think that you can 
base part of your selection criteria on a supplier's past performance? Or put another way, how many of you believe that you are not permitted to take past performance into account when you're making supplier selection? So historically, and in fact, you know, we're running a, a range of commercial skills for leaders programs. I don't know whether you've heard about those, but we uh, were recruited by cabinet office to run these for senior civil servants. And we've now been running a number of those. And we found a lot of people on those programs believe that you cannot use past performance as one of the criteria uh, in supplier selection. Now that is a policy that changed uh, some time ago. The Cabinet Office issued instruction on that and in fact it's also changed under the new EU public procurement procedures. But that's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, you probably wouldn't marry somebody without knowing a bit about their past performance, or at least it would be helpful. So the range of criteria we need to consider and can validly consider uh, are growing and are critically important as we look again across this spectrum of partnership. Now 23% of respondents tell us that uh, contract and its negotiation undermine efforts to generate successful results on a frequent basis. 60% say it happens on an occasional basis. So unfortunately we've got a long way to go in improving a lot of those contracting practices. Because if 23%, a quarter of people, are saying this is a frequent problem, and 60% saying it's a, an occasional problem, that suggests that probably 30 to 35% of all contracts are not really fit for purpose. Which does, coincidentally, coincide with other research we've done, which suggests, indeed, about 35% of contracts are not really fit for purpose, and that they undermine good results rather than support them. Now the cost of a third of our contracts underperforming is pretty hefty. It's a massive opportunity to use contracting as a much more effective discipline for quality control. What about collaboration and joint working? Well, there was pretty wide understanding of the attributes that are needed for successful relationships. And uh, we found that, and find today still, that uh, contract negotiators generally make very limited use of the mechanisms that are available that actually drive better performance. In other words, most negotiators are far more focused on the consequences when things go wrong than they are on reducing the probability that things will go wrong. And those are two very different aspects, of course, of risk management. Balanced risk management is about both consequence and probability. Most contracts are very strong on consequence and very short on probability. So let's look at those probabilities. Let's look at the things that actually are typically the causes of things going wrong. Performance measurements. Oh yes, well most contracts have a lot of them, so we must be pretty good on that one. Well, no, because the very problem is many contracts have a lot of them. <laughs> In other words, they create obfuscation, they create lack of clarity. What really are the goals and objectives here? If I've got 150 KPIs, which one is actually important? Japanese car manufacturers stormed and took over the world because they had a very clear focus on what was needed, quality. They used quality as the driver for everything else. It was the single ultimate KPI. And everything else was judged in terms of does it contribute to quality. <coughs> and in fact, they only started to run into problems when they started to corrupt that core value. When they actually decided that cost, they were, unfortunately, they brought in too many consultants. And they started to corrupt their value system by focus on cost. Well, you probably remember what happened to Toyota. And of course, they've had to try and reverse the damage to reputation because things like accelerators that stick are not great news when you've got a consumer product. Rather like, you know, Boeing with their focus on cost and the smoking batteries that seem to have rather dented our confidence in traveling on the Dreamliner. So we need to be very conscious of what impacts 
performance measurement are actually having and whether they're actually providing us with the information we need to drive continuous improvement. <coughs> or are they just creating confusion? Are they creating an environment where we just dispute whose, whose truth is true <laughs> um, and get into essentially un, uh, you know, unedifying environments where we are not really able to use those performance measures for any real purpose. Communication. <clears throat> How many of you manage to have a good relationship with no communication? You know, I suspect that by and large you would recognise that communication actually lies at the heart of healthy, strong relationships. Implicit within communication is also about the quality of that communication. And interestingly, if you look at many successful trading relationships, they are far more dependent upon qualitative measures than they are on quantitative measures. If I may lose the automotive industry again for a moment, I've just been reading a, an excellent academic report that was trying to understand the virtual demise of the US automotive industry. And it told a wonderful story there, where it was saying that uh, uh, General Motors, who of course in the early 80s had 60% market share in the US, which plummeted to only about 19% 20 years later, and is still on its way down. But during this process, they were at least aware that the fact that the Japanese had different processes. So apparently a, a vice president at General Motors uh, sent a team of his staff with cameras into a Toyota manufacturing plant and said, bring me back photos of every step of the process and then we're going to duplicate it. So they brought back the photos and they tried to replicate it, but it didn't work. And the point that these researchers from Harvard are making is that actually what you couldn't capture on film was behavior. You couldn't capture the environment of internal collaboration. You couldn't replicate the loyalty of workers who felt motivated to drive continuous improvement compared with the GM workers who felt alienated. You couldn't distinguish that environment of praise and reward from that environment of blame. And those were the fundamental differences. On the Japanese production lines, there was, I can't remember what it's called exactly, it was a great word and I'm going to make a, a chart about it. Apparently, there's a chord. If you can see, if you observe a problem, something that could be improved, you are acknowledged and rewarded if you pull the cord. When GM tried to put it in, Everybody was afraid to pull the cord because they thought that they would be blamed for stopping the production line. They never pulled it, so they never improved. <coughs> to what extent do we create that culture within our trading relationships? Are we truly partnering or do we just use the word and then continue with our old world thinking in terms of allocation of blame and fault? I was with one of the major banks recently. They asked me to go in and do a presentation to their supply relationship managers. Okay, supplier relationship managers. Bear in mind that word, relationship. Because one would assume that investing in those people, that they would think, you know, we want a relationship. And one would presume that they wanted it to be somewhat positive. But anyway, halfway through the presentation, one of them raised his hands and said, this is all very interesting, but hands up everybody in the room who agrees with me that all suppliers are evil. <laughs> and everybody raised their hand. So I wonder what sort of relationships they had with their suppliers. <laughs> these are important characteristics. And in fact, many of these are the result of academic research that says in sustainable relationships, these characteristics must be present. And what we've been doing is, in fact, adopting these and basing these into what we term relational contracting. Now, for any of you who have a legal background, you will know that relational contracting is not attributable to IECCM as a concept. It actually goes back to 1963, um, when uh, Ian McNeil, one of the um, leading legal academics, wrote about the concept of relational contracting. And what Ian McNeil observed was that in longer-term relationships where 
there was more interdependency between the partners and where you were perhaps driven more towards an output or an outcome as opposed to a pure simple purchase, that the administrative features of the contract became dominant in their importance and classical legal theory diminished. Now classical legal theory is essentially this negative incentive concept. It's the idea that indemnities and liabilities and the like will drive performance. And when he was using the term administrative, this was of course the view of administration 50 years ago, it wasn't the belittling term that says it's administrative, outsource it to India or, uh, or, or turn it into a software program. It was very much a, a respected word that was much more about what we would call today probably governance and performance management. How good are your contracts and how good are your negotiations and the exploration with your partners of the methods by which you are going to undertake that administrative activity. Because if you think about this stuff, this is really about the governance and the performance management. You need to invest more time on this than you do on traditional negotiation. And you need to put the resources in place and determine in advance how you're going to structure and manage that relationship to a successful goal and end. So in order to do that, yes, you need to think about communication. How many of your contracts have anticipated the reality of the way you will communicate today? So, how many of you still write letters with a pen? How many of you use instant messages? How many of your contracts have anticipated the use of instant messaging? How often do you think perhaps some of your delivery teams and your, and your supply partners use instant messaging to communicate? Have you ever envisaged it? Have your contracts envisaged it? And if they haven't, why haven't they? We live in a digital world. We need to accept the reality. Oh, but you know, it's risky. Oh my goodness, that we might enable people electronic communication? Oh my goodness me. I was reading an Inside Council article, it's a US publication, and it was talking about how the tech world of technology is even coming to the lawyers today. And it was using as an example, it said, you know, some, um, some law firm partners are today even writing their own emails. We have, by and large, contracting practices that are driven by an archaic profession that is failing to adapt to the realities of a digital world. That is a source of risk. The EU recently published something which was saying, today's <coughs> contracts are largely written by lawyers, for lawyers, in the expectation of litigation. And that creates risk. How often do you litigate? Oh, it's a bad question I know to ask of the MOJ right now, because <laughs> the answer is sometimes. But as a, in terms of a level of frequency, obviously very little. Yet that seems to be the number one risk that we're often protecting against. Yet in fact, if you did a proper risk analysis, you'd find it was probably number 55 or number 155 on the list of risks. So what we need to do is focus on these areas that will reduce the probability of things going wrong. And let me give you one quick example again on that communication front. There is contract management software out there today, for example, that recognizes that instant messaging use of social media is the norm. So it builds in the capability within the contract management tool for the parties to communicate using social media forms and it captures all of that data as part of the contract management system. So it's part of your contract record. It is contractual. Oh, and by the way, if you're worried about the courts, as you've probably realized, the courts today recognize things like instant messaging and so on as being part of discovery. It's been used extensively against, well, extensive would be a wrong word, there hasn't exactly been extensive prosecution of the banking industry, but in those few little instances where there's been some recourse, it's actually been used, of course, within court as part of the discovery process. 
So a lot of this is about trying to work with our partners around the reality of what databases do we need? How are we going to undertake joint problem solving? What are the forums? Who needs to be involved? How does problem solving differ from performance management? Are there different people that need to be involved? How do we escalate? Are the escalation records appropriate? Oh, that clause in the contract that says we'll communicate? Oh yeah, of course, we've got one of those, so we're covered. Yeah, well, the communications clause in the contract is usually that any variation to this contract must be in writing and should be delivered to the following address. That is about the extent of how much we define the model of communication within our contracts. So, these areas are actually of critical importance and if anybody is interested in any of this in more depth, it is, as I said, something that we've been working on a lot to embed these sorts of principles as contractual supplements so that there is clarity and commitment between the parties on how these things will occur and how they will work. And in fact, they come back periodically and they review the effectiveness of these approaches. The Australian government has been running a number of workshops with us on this and they've now decided that relational contracting is the way they now wish to work with their supply base. They've actually set up, or in process of setting up, a relational contracting centre of competence to roll this out across, US, uh, across Australian government. What are some of the constraints? Well, one of the biggest challenges we face today is, in fact, scope uncertainty. And there are a number of drivers that cause scope uncertainty. One is, um, a potential lack of honesty on both parties. There are incentives very often on the buyer to, under, to understate scope because, hey, then I'll get a lower price. I'll surprise them with the truth afterwards. Um, and of course, there's a tendency on the part of salespeople to overrepresent their ability to meet scope. We'll worry about that later. And they don't want, of course, to be too honest about your true requirements to their internal finance people because then the price might go up. So unfortunately, we have this sort of, I hate to use the word, axis of evil, but it is almost an axis of evil in this process where the parties play a game with each other and don't really want to be completely honest for differing reasons, but it suits both of them to actually not be too clear about requirements. And that, of course, is a disaster. But there is another side to this, which is with the volatility in today's business environment, with the speed of change, with new technologies, new competition, scope is continually changing. And very often it's very hard to predict it. You guys in government are often at the forefront of innovation. Many of the things you seek to do here in this building are the first time anybody sought to do it. Or certainly the first time in the UK. Which brings us to another point of how often do you look more generally? How often do you look overseas? How often do you try to find out whether others have already done this and you could learn from it and create certainty that way? But many times you're not absolutely clear how you're going to get something done. So that requires us to also recognize that part of partnering today is the management of uncertainty and putting the processes and the contracting models in place that enable the management of uncertainty. That's partly through things like your governance processes, but it's also through looking at different contracting models. For those who are familiar with software development, for example, the term agile contracting will probably mean something to you. It may mean breaking your contract into more manageable chunks. It may be that you need to actually uh, pay suppliers to do an initial discovery to determine um, scope in, in a fuller sense so that it can be properly priced. So we need to be much more open to the point that uncertainty is in many respects today's normality and we need to think about our contracting commercial practices to manage uncertainty. Inappropriate risk transfer we've touched on, a whole team approach. Are we inclusive? Do we know what the whole team should be? Do we actually understand the range of expertise that we need? Have we consulted widely enough? Have we done enough predetermination? Have we welcomed interaction with other parties? Because one of the, I think, challenges for civil services, it often feels a little bit under challenge. It often feels a little bit that it needs to operate under a mantle of greater secrecy. But of course, that means that we don't have open access to good information. 
So trying to overcome again, how do we bring in the right people? How do we gather the right information to validate what, what is doable and so on is really important. I'm just going to skip to the bottom there, a couple of important points. There are some differences you can see here between public and private sector. Interestingly, seeking inappropriate risk transfer, the public sector is less likely to consider that a constraint. Now, I think that's for the reason we talked about earlier, that because the rules have actually determined what risk transfer is, it's something we don't tend to think about. And we maybe don't realise that what we're doing is abnormal as far as our private sector suppliers are concerned. The second thing was failure to consider commercial issues early enough, where um, the public sector was also less likely to consider that a main constraint. But again, perhaps that's because commercialism has not really been part of the skills development for civil service. And while certainly from my experience, the level of talent in civil service is incredible, perhaps the areas of training and skills development has not been as broad and has not been entirely appropriate to the new service delivery models you're now being called upon to make. And that has been a problem for the private sector as well. The Dreamliner was in fact a classic example of that. It was produced under a very, very different production and service delivery model, but nobody thought about the internal skill sets or the way that they were going to have to operate and manage suppliers in that new service delivery model. The result was it didn't work very well. It was very late, it was massively over cost, and they've got big quality problems. Okay, what are the causes of disputes? This is pretty important because if we understand what causes disputes, then of course we can begin to address quality issues. As you look at the portfolio of trading relationships that you as an organization manage, does anybody give you oversight that says, or insight that says, and across that portfolio of 20,000 contracts or whatever it is, here are the major ty typical things that go wrong. Has anybody got that data? Because I'd love to have it. But don't worry, very few other people do it either. Yet surely this goes to the heart of quality management. Surely this is about learning from past mistakes and avoiding them being repeated. So why aren't we collecting that data? Why don't we know that things like scope or goal change are a major cause of dispute? Responsibilities of the parties, lack of clarity over who's responsible for doing what, major cause of dispute. If we had this list in front of us, and you do now, then you can begin to anticipate these problems and say, have I safeguarded against these in the way that I've written this contract and in the way I've set up the management of this contract? And of course, avoidance of claim and dispute is a very good way to keep a partnership on track. What's the impact of weakness in contract and negotiation? Well, I'll tell you that the consolidated impact based upon some research we've been doing is that at least for the private sector, the average private sector company loses the equivalent of 9% of its annual revenue each year through weaknesses in its contracting. 9% of its revenue. If you're a $100 billion company, that means $9 billion that is being lost. Now, that's a combination of their buy side and sell side activity, and obviously you don't sell a whole lot of things. So the good news for you is your figure is probably not 9% of wastage. But if you accumulate the losses that have occurred because of weaknesses in contracting, then I think you'd recognize it's a pretty big sum of money. And of course, it's typified by um, cost overruns, I'm sure you never have contracts where it costs more than was expected, but some people do. It sometimes is reflected in project delays, which of course also have all sorts of cost implications. Again, I know they don't happen here, but they do in some other departments I've heard. And failure to deliver the client business benefits. Well, 
again, we know that these are the things that happen. So what we're talking about in trying to drive better practices to, to establish more um, uh, successful partnerships is, of course, the elimination of some really unpleasant things. The things that, in fact, the Daily Mail loves, but we don't. 29% of respondents have no system to capture and share learning. And of those that do, only 27% think it works well. So nearly three quarters of people in this survey are essentially saying, we don't really learn from past mistakes or past successes. And again, if we want to establish more effective and more successful partnering, clearly that principle of sharing information and data more effectively is an important one. And many of you are probably in a position to facilitate that. Even on a small scale, just starting to learn, starting to share information of what works and what didn't work, working collectively to say how could we make it work better. Small pockets of people can make a tremendous difference. So what's our call to action from this evening? Well, we actually end where we began. Clarity of our goals and objectives. Do we actually mutually understand what it is we're trying to do and that we're committed to achieving? It is important to remember that suppliers share your interests in a successful outcome. Their motivations and drivers may be different in the sense that, yes, of course, they want to make money, they want to make profit, whereas you are delivering a public service where those Financial characteristics are not the same, although there are some similarities because you have to do it at an affordable level that the taxpayer is actually prepared to fund. But at the end of the day, success for you and the supplier has many common characteristics. They are not the enemy in that delivery process. Late engagement of commercial resource is another of the problems that frequently occurs. Some of you I know are those commercial resources, so that probably resonates with you, where you're often saying, if only I'd been involved earlier, this probably wouldn't have happened. So how do we engage earlier? <coughs> Part of that is we need to make more noise. We need to go forward with things like this report and suggest to senior management that we actually need to relook at our underlying strategies, processes for the development of partnering activity that we need the advisory uh, services and we need the commercial coordination at a much earlier phase of overall policy planning, development, delivery. Most organizations are relatively mature when it comes to technical risk assurance. Most organizations are quite immature when it comes to commercial risk assurance. And very often we rely on those punitive risk allocation terms to substitute for good commercial judgment. We've talked about the problems with defining project scope and I've highlighted the fact that we need to be more thoughtful about whether uncertainty is something that we've embedded because we didn't do a proper job on requirement or is it something that's a feature of the nature of what we're trying to achieve in which case we need a different contract design. We've talked about the use of traditional legally driven documents <clears throat> we are campaigning around that. Contracts today, particularly in services environments, need to be business instruments, not legal instruments. They have to be translatable and understandable. By making them obscure, by removing the benefit of the contract as a usable document for a delivery team, quite simply we are creating risk. Are we designing our contracts in a way that people can use them? Have we thought about the use of graphics and visualization in our contracts? In the US, there have been some great examples of that, actually out of the justice system, where they're using increasingly pictures rather than words. Because a lot of people actually understand pictures. It sort of reminds you of some of those instruction books that you get with sort of the Japanese manufacturer of products where you're trying to read the words and thinking, what on earth is this about? But when they turn it into pictures, we're okay. We could spend quite a time on that. Maybe I can come back and talk <laughs> about visualization in contracts another time. Um, few organizations make use of past contracts as a source of learning. And then finally, 
only 16% of the respondents, and as I mentioned, this is public and private sector, only 16% feel that their contracting process consistently achieves a positive impact on the relationship between the parties. So in other words, 84% say it does not. So there's plenty to work for here and plenty of opportunity. And I hope this has outlined to you some of those checklists, some of those points, pausing for thought, that are going to be critical to actually building not only a partnership, but importantly, a successful partnership. So thank you.